Well, welcome to a series of uh, studies together on Bunyan's uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, next to the Bible, uh, Pilgrim's Progress has been the most published book in the English language. Uh, I teach at a seminary I have done for 17 years, and I frequently ask students, how many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress? And I'm uh, amazed, staggered even, uh, these days to find that maybe less than 20%, sometimes as few as 10% of the class have ever read Pilgrim's Progress. And I tell them uh, with uh, considerable gravitas uh, that they will not get into heaven having not read Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, I was in the company of uh, someone just recently, and uh, a man who'd spent his lifetime as a preacher and uh, asked him what his uh, favorite book was, uh, other than the Bible. And immediately he said, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. And I think if you're of a certain generation, as uh, a couple of you are, uh, then uh, I imagine Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress was something that uh, you read, perhaps if you're raised in a Christian home, read in your in your home and read by maybe your parents or maybe studied it in Sunday school. But uh, I, I have this fear that uh, Pilgrim's Progress, this may be the generation where Pilgrim's Progress sort of disappears. And um, that would be a tragedy. Uh, this is a book uh, published, the first part of Pilgrim's Progress. There are two parts. Uh, the first part was published in 1678. Uh, and then six years later, the second part in 1684, and uh, we're going to study together both parts. Now, if I were to ask the question, how many have read part two of Pilgrim's Progress, the story of Christiana and the four uh, boys, uh, then uh, we're considerably down uh, into single figures in terms of percentage-wise. And uh, probably for every hundred that have read Pilgrim's Progress Part 1, may, maybe two or three have read Part 2. Uh, but in many ways, Part 2 of the story is an even uh, better story in some ways than Part 1. Uh, and theologically, there are some fascinating things that take place in Part 2 that uh, don't take place in Part 1. Not least, of course, you have a woman's angle in part two. It's the story of Mrs. Uh, Christian, Christiana. And you have a, a family story, and it's a, it's a much more of a corporate story than the more individualistic story of uh, part one. Uh, I'll be telling the story of Bunyan himself a little bit as we go along. I won't uh, belabor you with all of the details of Bunyan's life in the first uh, lecture. That would be one way of doing it. But I thought I would weave in to the narrative of Pilgrim's Progress uh, certain factors from uh, Bunyan's own life. Because Pilgrim's Progress Part 1, for sure, is autobiographical. And many of the things and many of the problems that arise, and, and there are a couple of problems that arise, theological problems that arise in the course of Pilgrim's Progress that can only be understood as... Bunyan relating something that is deeply biographical in his own experience of uh, salvation. Now, everyone is familiar with certain characters uh, from Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, worldly Wiseman, uh, Lord Hate Good, Mr. Legality, uh, Mr. Live Loose, Giant Despair, or uh, place names like uh, the House of Interpreter, uh, Doubting Castle, uh, the Valley of humiliation, the delectable mountains, bypath meadow. Some of these have uh, weaved their way into English literature generally, and uh, some of them are still used uh, as, uh, as phrases in common speech to this day. And uh, perhaps uh, even in the secular world, uh, they, will, uh, they will use the term bypath meadow without realizing that this is uh, from Pilgrim's uh, Progress. Well, let's, uh, let's begin, as they say. I used to li listen to a BBC a children's program when I was very uh, little uh, on the radio before, before pictures um, of that sort of generation. And uh, I can remember uh, this very pronounced Oxford uh, 
uh, accent saying, are you sitting comfortably? Then let's begin. And it begins with these very familiar words. Uh, as I walked through the wilderness of this world, I lighted on a certain place where was a den. And I laid me down in that place to sleep. And I slept and I dreamed a dream. And those are very familiar uh, words, aren't they? I'm actually reading from a fairly recent uh, publication of Pilgrim's Progress, uh, published in 2008 by uh, Penguin Classics. And this is one in which the notes uh, are given by a Bunyan scholar by the name of Roger Pooley. And uh, he is perhaps today uh, the uh, Bunyan scholar uh, in the world. Uh, the name of Roger Sharrock uh, is a well-known name in academic circles and again uh, an Oxford uh, scholar, scholar in all things Bunyan, wrote a massive uh, treatment of Bunyan and his uh, theology. And there are various editions, there are probably a hundred editions of Pilgrim's Progress, but this will be the one that I'll be uh, alluding to as we uh, go along the 2008 a Penguin edition edited by Roger Pooley. Well, let's, uh, let's begin at the very beginning. And it's the very first thing that Bunyan notes for us. And that is that here is a man uh, who has in his hands a book. Uh, you discover this man, he's uh, under a great deal of stress. He's carrying this burden upon his back. Uh, but he's carrying, uh, he's outside the city of destruction, and he's carrying uh, a book. And uh, something that you don't actually uh, learn until uh, later on uh, in the narrative, that the city is called the city of destruction. Uh, it's where his wife is and his children are. Uh, Bunyan uh, is uh, telling us uh, the way of salvation. And uh, for Bunyan... In the 17th century, the way of salvation begins with conviction of sin. Uh, unless you understand sin, unless you understand the weightiness of sin, the gravitas of sin, unless you have a conviction of sin and sinfulness, uh, then uh, the, the doctrine of salvation makes no sense. So the first, actually the first 20 pages or so, is an extended uh, consideration of this issue of uh, sin. Perhaps in Bunyan's mind is not only his own experience of salvation, but per perhaps the, the template for salvation for Bunyan is the Philippian uh, jailer uh, in Acts chapter 16 who cries out, having come under a conviction of sin with Paul and Silas in, uh, in prison in, in Philippi, uh, what must I do to be saved? And uh, Bunyan gives us a little description of uh, what has happened to bring this man uh, into this uh, melancholy state of mind. I'm quoting now from Pilgrim's Progress. I looked and saw him open the book and read therein. And as he read, he wept and trembled. And not being able longer to contain, he break out with a lamentable cry saying, what shall I do? And uh, the background, you can hear the background of Acts uh, 16 and the Philippian jailer, what must I do to be saved? Well, this is, uh, this is Bunyan telling you the way of salvation. This is Bunyan giving you evangelism in the 17th century. And it begins with the book, begins with the Bible, begins with the Word of God, and it comes to this man as he reads the Bible, perhaps for the first time in his life, and it brings him under this conviction uh, of sin. The Bible then has convicted him uh, of the danger of his position. Now, Bunyan was born in 1628 uh, to Thomas and Margaret Bunyan in a little village uh, called Elstow uh, in uh, Bedfordshire and uh, about a mile or so outside of uh, Bedford itself in Bedfordshire. And uh, John uh, Bunyan was raised in uh, very humble uh, circumstances. His father was a tinker or a brassier. That, that is a, a man who would go uh, from house to house, perhaps from farm to farm, 
uh, to mend um, pots and pans, anything really made of metal. Uh, these days, if your if your saucepan, you know, doesn't doesn't have that Teflon uh, non-stick surface on it, and it's not working as it did, you toss it and you go to Walmart or somewhere and you buy a new one. Uh, well, in Bunyan's day, you called Bunyan's father, and he would come and he would fix it, and he would go from home to home. Uh, he uh, lives in this, uh, this location uh, for 16 years, until he's 16, and he's, uh, um, you know, we need to remember that this is uh, the 1640s, and England is in civil war. Uh, Parliament against uh, the king. Uh, it's the only period of civil war in English history uh, that would result in um, England becoming a republic for a decade uh, during the 1650s and uh, under the, uh, the rule or tyranny, depending on how you look at it, of Oliver Cromwell. And then in 1660, the restoration of uh, Charles II. But uh, in 1649, uh, Charles I, the king, uh, would be taken out into the streets of London and his head would be severed from his body uh, to a great crowd and a, and a roar. And uh, one of the Puritans, uh, uh, Thomas Goodwin, I think it was, who was there, um, maybe it was Richard Sibbs, and uh, he fainted uh, when he saw uh, Charles I's head uh, being severed from his body. Well, uh, some events occur in Bunyan's home. His mother uh, dies, uh, and then within months, uh, his sister dies. Uh, and uh, within uh, three months of the death of his mother, his father remarries um, very quickly um, on whatever consideration you, you uh, look at that. That was very quick. And uh, Bunyan left home and uh, didn't have a great uh, relationship, I think, with uh, the new uh, stepmother. And uh, he lies, I think, about his age, and he joins the parliamentary uh, forces and becomes a soldier. He's, he's just 16. And uh, I don't think Bunyan ever saw battle. Uh, he, he, he might have witnessed the results of battle. He certainly didn't fight in any of the great battles of the Civil uh, War. And, uh, uh, he's disbanded in 1646. He's been uh, may maybe as much as two years, probably more like 18 months, uh, involved then in this uh, civil uh, war. He would have been 17 or 18 uh, when he was uh, disbanded. Now he tells us uh, that until he got married, which would be in about three years from now, uh, he describes his life as stained with crimson sins. Now, he insists with uh, great passion later uh, that he wasn't a drunkard and he wasn't sexually promiscuous in any way. But uh, like Newton, Bunyan would say, I had few equals for cursing, swearing, lying, and blaspheming the holy name of God. Heaven and hell were both out of sight and out of mind. And as far as saving and damning, they were least in my thoughts." In 1649, he's 21 years of age, he marries. Uh, this lady would bear four children. We do not know her name. It's one of the astonishing things. Uh, it was a wonderful marriage, Bunyan loved her dearly. Uh, she bore him four children, uh, but we do not know her name. She brought into the marriage two uh, religious books, uh, Arthur Dent's Plain Man's Pathway to Heaven, and then uh, Bishop Bailey's The Practice of Piety. Well, a few years into this uh, marriage, Bunyan, uh, whose, whose life uh, was, was far from uh, Christian, and uh, uh, he, is, uh, he is caught one day playing a game of tip cat on the Sabbath day. This is the 17th century. Uh, part of the Civil War in the 1640s was over something called the Book of Sports uh, that, that was to the forefront uh, of religious uh, debate in the 1640s. Uh, and he is chastised, uh, chastised fairly severely for being caught playing tip cut on uh, the Sabbath day. Uh, he says, as he's uh, struck by this rebuke, uh, 
Um, he, somebody says to him, wilt thou leave thy sins and go to heaven, or wilt thou have thy sins and go to hell? And Bunyan says, my state is surely miserable. Miserable if I leave my sins, but miserable if I follow them. I cannot but be damned, and if I must be so, I had as good be damned for many sins as to be damned for few. Uh, but he couldn't get rid of conscience that easily, and a month later he's standing outside a shop uh, window, swearing and cursing, and uh, a woman of ill repute, uh, who happens to be there, uh, chastises him for his uh, language, and he falls uh, silent and he hangs his head in shame. And he will be under this conviction of sin for 18 months. Uh, he, is, uh, he is on his way to salvation. He's on his way to the cross, uh, but he will be under this burden, this conviction of sin uh, for 18 months. That's very important to understand Pilgrim's Progress, because one of the questions uh, that has often been uh, asked of Pilgrim's Progress is, why does Bunyan take so long for Christian to get saved? Uh, why, does, uh, why does Christian, uh, why is he sent by evangelists to the wicked uh, gate, the straight gate? Uh, evangelist, this, uh, this stereotypical evangelist, who's probably uh, depicted after the manner of the Baptist minister in Bedford, who was uh, Bunyan's mentor and discipler and uh, John Gifford, and that's probably the template for evangelist. An evangelist uh, says to him, do you, see, uh, do you see the sepulcher? Do you see the cross? And uh, Bunyan says, uh, Christian says, no, he doesn't see it. Uh, but then uh, instead, evangelist says, well, do you see yon wicket gate, uh, the straight gate? Straight is the gate that enters uh, into everlasting life and broad is the, is the gate that uh, leads to hell. Do you see that straight gate? And that's been, a, that's been a question that's been asked, why did Bunyan have Christian go to the straight gate rather than go to the cross, rather than go to Calvary, rather than go uh, straight to Jesus? And I think the answer to that is Bunyan's own experience, his autobiographical um, experience of salvation that he was under conviction of sin where he couldn't see the solution. He couldn't see the answer uh, to his uh, need. And a Christian uh, then, uh, he's, he's not yet a Christian, of course. He's actually called graceless. We learn this later. His name is changed to, to Christian. And uh, he, says, uh, he says, sir, I perceive by my book in my hand, he's talking to evangelist, that I am condemned to die and after that to come to judgment. And I find I am unwilling to do the first, nor able to do the latter. He doesn't want to die, and he cannot think of coming before God in judgment. And evangelist tells him where he needs to go. He needs to go to the wicked gate. Well, this is the gate of uh, entry that uh, Jesus speaks of in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 7. And then let me pick up uh, part of what Evangelist then says uh, to Christian. Uh, he says to him, uh, he gives him a parchment roll, and there was written uh, on this parchment roll, fly from the wrath to come. Uh, and we read, the man therefore read it, and looking up upon Evangelist, very carefully said, whither must I fly? Then said Evangelist, pointing with his finger over a very wide field, do you see yonder wicket gate? The man said, no. Then said the other, do you see yonder shining light? He said, I think I do. Then said evangelist, keep that light in your eye and go up directly thereto. So shalt thou see the gate at which when thou knockest, it shall be told thee what to do. So I saw in my dream, that the man began to run. Now he had not run far from his own door, but his wife and children, perceiving it, began to cry after him to return. But the man put his fingers in his ears and ran on crying, life, life, eternal life. So he looked not behind him, but fled towards the middle 
of the plain. Well, that's how Bunyan uh, sets the scene uh, in the opening two or three pages of Pilgrim's Progress. It's a scene of uh, this man, Christian, actually called Graceless, and he is running with his fingers in his ears away from his wife and children and the city of destruction. And he's running, he doesn't quite know where, towards a light that is shining. But he's carrying this enormous burden upon his back. Well, this is a road trip. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a great journey. Uh, it's a tale uh, told uh, in a style that is very familiar to us, and especially, I think, in 2012, uh, when we are living in an age in which uh, fantasy literature is, uh, again, uh, very popular, and uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, Tolkien is another road trip, uh, beginning in one place and ending in another. And uh, so for the next... Uh, I don't know how many, but for the next uh, number of sessions, we're going to look at uh, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress and see the journey that this um, man, Christian, makes to find salvation.